Alpha Force Zero wrote her first computer program today. Her first program was something that asks how many white and brown mice you have, and then adds those numbers together. And in celebration, I figured I would talk about computers. We're going to talk about encryption and compression today. Before starting, I'd like to point out that encryption and compression are basically done the same way, but for different reasons and sometimes with different methods, depending on the situation. For our purposes, though, we can just call them the exact same procedure. Imagine you're writing a letter to the love of your life, but the letter's too long. You're going to have to use another stamp. So to save stamps, you decide to replace each instance of the words I love you with the code 1011. That probably won't be used anywhere else in the letter, and you've just cut your letter's length in half. There's just one more thing to do. Write the key on the letter so the person knows to replace every instance of 1011 with I love you. This is the basic idea behind encryption and compression. Typically, the software will go through whatever it is it's encrypting and look for patterns. When it finds a pattern, it marks it and replaces it. The eventual goal of compression is to end up with something that doesn't have a detectable pattern. So what can be compressed? Well, computers basically convert everything into a file. Everything from the game you play to the email you sent are files. But the computer treats certain files differently. First, we have what's called ASCII files, also known as text files. Those are basically files that have special flags on them to tell the computer how to read them. The second important type of file is called a binary file. You've probably noticed extensions on file names too, run.exe or resume.doc, that kind of thing. Those extensions tell the operating system which program to use to open and run the file. So what is binary? Some people's eyes glaze over when they hear that word, but don't be intimidated. With electronics, the quickest and easiest way to store information is in what's called a bit. You can picture it like a light switch. If the switch is on, electricity is flowing through it. If it's off, it isn't. A collection of eight of those little switches is called a byte. 1024 bytes is called a kilobyte, from the Greek prefix kilo, meaning thousand. 1000 kilobytes makes a megabyte. 1024 megabytes is a gigabyte. Then terabytes, then petabytes, then exabytes, then zettabytes, and it goes on from there. For perspective, you probably have a one terabyte hard drive in your computer right now. Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook store roughly 1,200 petabytes between them. That's 1.2 million terabytes. There's an important reason why it's 1,024 and not 1,000 even. It's because pretty much everything with computers is in base 2, since the switches can either be on or off. So everything doubles. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, 8128, 16, 256, 32, 512, and so on. It's not always a technical requirement that certain things are those exact sizes, more of an industry standard. My MacBook has a 256 gigabyte hard drive. It's not that they couldn't have put in 255 instead. It's just that the computer counts by twos, so they've set it as a standard. And one more thing on this subject. A common problem when counting this way is that people forget that the number zero counts toward the total. So actually the numbers usually go from zero to 255, or zero to 16,127, for example. Back to binary. As I said before, the switches come in sets of eight. All of these switches are set to zero to start. If the computer is reading, say, a text file, it'll look at each individual switch and convert the byte to a whole number between zero and 255. Each character on your keyboard is assigned one of these numbers. Here's a chart of which characters each number corresponds to. Everything from the lowercase and uppercase alphabet to a space to the ampersand sign to the backspace. Yes, even backspace has its own binary representation. If you notice, this chart doesn't go above 128. That's important, but I'll address it in a minute. So here's a very basic explanation of how binary works. Starting out with eight on-off switches, each switch represents a number. We ask, is this switch on? Yes. Okay, then we add that switch's number to the total and go to the next one. Starting from the left, the switches represent 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 
2, and 1. If you notice, none of the characters go above 128. That's important now because the first switch represents 128. The computer recognizes ASCII files, or text files, by the fact that the binary in text files always has the last bit set to 0. So let's convert the lowercase letter a to binary. We know a is 97 from the chart. Does 128 go into 97? No, it's too big. So that first switch is always going to be set to 0. Does 64 go into 97? Yes, so we mark that switch as 1 and subtract. 97 minus 64 is 33. The next switch is 32. Does 32 go into 33? Yes, mark it and subtract. Now we have 1. The 16, 8, 4, and 2 switches don't go into 1, so they're all 0. The last switch is 1, and of course it does go into 1, so we mark that one and we look at the set. So the binary representation of the lowercase letter a is 0110001. There, the binary portion of this is over. That wasn't so bad, was it? Now back to encryption and compression. The term 256-bit encryption might start to make a little more sense now. 256-bit encryption is where they take a set of 256 bits, or on-off switches, and set them in a certain pattern. So if we wanted to see how many options could be contained within 256 bits, we would just have to calculate 2 to the 256th power. And that adds up to 1.158 to the 77th power, which is 1 with 77 zeros after it. That's close to as many protons as there are in the known universe. Having a computer try to guess at the key is unreasonable. It would never happen. So it's the most secure type of encryption. It's just not getting cracked. At least not by guessing. So if anybody's interested, this actually relates to the San Bernardino shooting case with Apple. Remember how the FBI was trying to force Apple to unlock this shooter's phone because they couldn't gain access to it? Well, that's because every iPhone has a little chip on it that contains a 256-bit key. Every time you type your passcode in, the phone checks to make sure that the passcode was correct, and that chip sends it that 256-bit code, which is used to decrypt the information on the phone and display it for you. If you type in the wrong passcode 10 times on an iPhone, the chip basically deletes that code, so the phone can never be decrypted. The FBI wanted Apple to push a software update to the phone to remove the 10-try restriction, so instead of having to guess the decryption code, they could just guess a four-digit number. Eventually, though, another company came in and said they could break the passcode block. There are a few theories on how they did this, which include a replay attack, where they copy the phone's memory somewhere safe and make a few guesses. Then they reload the phone's memory to make a few more guesses. Supposedly, this one doesn't work. Another theory is that they might have exploited a previously unknown vulnerability of some sort. It's hard to tell, but in the end, they got in it, so it doesn't really matter. That's all I've got for you. Thanks for listening to me ramble on about computers. Talk to you guys next time.